Hello everyone and welcome back to my Beyond History series in Kerbal Space Program 1.1.3 and in this episode we begin with the Jupiter Low Orbit mission which we will do a plane change burn for, a pretty expensive plane change burn because we're trying to fulfill this contract to get into this uh, pinkish purple, uh, I don't know what color you want to call it, orbit around Jupiter but our approach led us into this sort of polar orbit but we're going to make this maneuver, it's going to cost 3,700 and then we'll see after that whether we can get into the low orbit. After that I want to test out a vehicle to uh, potentially recover our Kerbal who is really currently stranded on the moon. Um, it, uh, the Kerbal on the moon has plenty of supplies but we don't actually have a vehicle down there to recover that Kerbal and so I want to test out a new thing to see if that will work out uh, more reliably, let's say, than a Lunapod, which is what we have been using before. Okay, so, yep, yeah, on that note, let's proceed with this. There is Jupiter. The new launch with the what I've called the Super Lem. The Super Lem is going to be riding on top of a new Nerva stage. The problem with the old Nerva stage is that we were using hypergolic RCS, which is a pain to replenish. Uh, this new Nerva will just be using hydrogen gas RCS, which is not as efficient, but simpler to replenish because you're just sending hydrogen for the main engine as well as the RCS instead of having to send different sets of repellents. The hydrogen gas RCS is not as efficient as the hypergolics, but yeah, it's simpler. Uh, it's also overall a larger stage, I think, than the original nervous stage I'd sent up. Okay, node. Okay, and checking that settled. Ignition. One of our big problems right now is that we don't have any cryogenic stages that both throttle and have lots of ignitions. Otherwise, that would make it a lot easier to use those engines on the moon itself. So we're still stuck using hypergolic engines for actual lunar landings. The RL-10 is the best as far as um, normal cryogenics uh, with its 10 ignitions, but we do have the Nerva and other nuclear engines that only use liquid hydrogen, and those either have 60 like the Nerva or are unlimited like the the 40 kilonewton one that we have as well as the um, RTG one, the candle. The trouble with the candle is, uh, well, the trouble with all of those is that the thrust, thrust to weight ratio is pretty bad. Uh, Nerva is 10 tons providing 300 kilonewtons, um, which is, you know, quite a lot more than any other engine. Uh, RL-10 here is just, uh, mm, it's like 60 times lighter than the Nerva and provides 73 kilonewtons, which is a quarter, so it's got 15 times the thrust to weight ratio of a Nerva. And that's just in terms of the engine. And the same sort of thrust to weight ratio is true of the other nuclear engines, including Candle. Candle is uh, 0.2 tons and only provides 4 kilonewtons. So it's pretty bad. Of course, none of the liquid hydrogen nuclear engines are particularly suitable for a lander because the tank for the liquid hydrogen tends to be rather big. Even if you made it into a huge pancake, then still the thrust weight ratio of those engines aren't exactly attractive. Okay, that's done, and... This is another interesting engine, the S5.92, but uh, it doesn't throttle, so it can't be used as a lander engine even though it has 50 ignitions, and somewhat, uh, it's still hypergolic, but it's somewhat more efficient than the Gemini lander engines, but the Gemini lander engines have infinite ignitions and throttle. Yeah, definitely did this burn too late. But in terms of flattening out, we're well on our way. Uh, 
And since we're on the slow part of the orbit, the timing of the burn isn't that sensitive, thankfully. So I've queued up that super limb launch. It's basically launching on a uh, on a Saturn V, well, you know, upgraded Saturn V, uh, Fiji 551. Well, actually, uh, Fiji 55N, I guess you could say, because uh, it's a Nerva upper stage instead of the J2. But um, yep, that's got 68 days. But we don't really have too much to deal with before we launch that. Uh, we've got this Exo Moon Explorer. SOI change uh, into Jupiter SOI but once it enters Jupiter SOI it's probably got a long time until it reaches periapsis anyway okay that's pretty much as advertised as plotted game is deciding whether it's gonna let me proceed okay now, if we can focus on, no, let's try and focus on Jupiter. We see our tangency to the target orbit. That's pretty good. I don't know how close it wants it. Let's say we add a maneuver here and bring it down. Yeah, it's going to cost a lot. And that's where we pass how much we actually have. Wow, 10,000. Well, I don't see any particular point wasting this probe on doing that right now. It's got 5,000 meters per second. It's in an awful orbit to rendezvous with anything else, though. Pretty much will never hit any other moon right now. But uh, I'll leave it in orbit with its delta V and ponder what to do with it. It's got two goo containers. Certainly with its delta V we can send it to one of the other moons just on a flyby. I wish I had more moons to send. I mean I could have put the RSS expanded though that has interesting problems of its own. I think I've probably done goo around all of these. That guy I've landed on Ganymede and Europa I think right? So yeah well yeah we're probably gonna need a nuclear stage in order to actually get into this tight orbit around Jupiter this effort was not sufficient okay well so noted and we'll leave this be let's turn to other things okay we are outside of Jupiter SOI with this Exo Moon Explorer don't be alarmed by the huge burn that it says we have to do that's because we haven't passed by Jupiter and that burn is after Jupiter Jupiter is going to make the difference in terms of that burn being limited uh, so our burn is actually over here and it's only 311 meters per second This is actually on its way out to Neptune but it's gonna take 17 years to get there so don't hold your breath but uh, let's just get into Jupiter SOI carefully and and it's getting pretty close to Jupiter but we don't really want to do anything at Jupiter I think I'll just uh, leave the next alarm as the alarm for the maneuver node any fine tuning can be done at the maneuver node uh, we can take a look at how it's approaching Neptune right now and let's touch it up using that maneuver node that's pretty close that's pretty close to Triton's orbit look at that okay and if we could nudge that in a little bit more make sure it hasn't inclined too much if we could get this done properly just about 500 meters per second then in 17 years well that, that's uh, getting pretty close to Triton right there even there we go then this burn will get us a initial Triton encounter and then we can do more stuff after that and this oh, is it gonna show me that is only a thousand six hundred meters per second thousand seven hundred let's say 
So after that, uh, we could figure out how to get into orbit around Triton and everything. So this maneuver node is what I want. And but we'll have to be patient about it. It's going to take a while. The slow journey allows us to uh, make sure that it doesn't cost that much to get into orbit around Neptune. If we were taking a whole series of boosts from Saturn and Uranus, for instance, then when we get to Neptune, it'll be tougher to slow down. We get there quicker, but it'll be tougher to slow down. All right, so that's all queued up. And this probe is going to fly by Jupiter, but we're not going to worry about that. It's a safe distance away. And uh, we'll just let it go on on its business. All right, it looks like the Super LEM launch is almost complete. So we'll try and test that system out, uncrewed uh, to the moon, and then of course, it, if it actually manages to land on the moon, then we'll be able to pick up that Kerbal and uh, eventually bring that Kerbal back to the station. We don't really need to bring the Kerbal back just yet because there's still food at the base, about 200 days, but we certainly need to test the system out before those 200 days run out. Okay, so here we are with the launch, and this is what the Fiji 5.5 N looks like with the Nerva upper, st upper stage there and we'll see how KOS handles it just running the normal 551 launch script um, yep I'll just go with that Saturn core uh, no let's go with this Delta core instead that should be higher up it should get to orbit on the first two stages but just in case okay we have ignition and launch. A little bit of pause. Alright. So we'll see exactly how much this Nerva stage can deliver to the moon and into lunar orbit, as well as how much Delta V it has left after that. I expect it to have some Delta V after that. Okay, we have center engine cutoff. G-force is still a bit above 4. And that's because these are operated engines, these are the F-1As. Okay, separation and ignition of the G-2s, five of them of course. Okay fairing separation. Gotta be sure it actually clears the big body of it. So this lander and I did use the limb can and just slapped a lot of tanks around it and also 90 days worth of food, water, and oxygen for two occupants. So quite a lot. It's got a propellant only docking port on its bottom and a Apollo docking system on its top. So either one will work with it. It's pretty wide at the at the base, as you can see, so certainly better than the Lunapod G's. More massive, though. Lunapod G can launch uh, to the moon on a much smaller rocket. Even without using a Nerva. Nerva wasn't strictly necessary for this launch. I just wanted to use it and launch the new Nerva tug. It is looking like we will make orbit on this stage. We have plenty of extra delta V. I could have made the nervous stage even bigger. It's pretty big right now. I should activate the radiators. Okay, program ended. We do have some delta V to spare, but we're not going to use it um, because it would be too cumbersome to turn this stage right now. And let's see if we get a clean separation for the Nerva. Okay, sep. Narcissus. I don't know. We seem awful stuck, don't we? Hold on. Uh, we're in some trouble. Okay, well, I've had this sort of situation before. So, uh.
Okay, well, I'm calling that a bug. <laughs> uh, hmm. No, I can't really do too much about it. And this is in bad condition. But, okay, let's revert to launch and then try and roll it back. And then make some adjustments in the VAB. Okay, well, unfortunately, it didn't let me recover. It crashed the game when I tried to recover. So let's maybe not try that out just yet. I instead I we really need do need to get something over there so that the Kerbal can return to orbit around the moon and potentially come back. So I'm gonna send a Lunapod G since we already have one built and potentially the Squad Lander. Maybe we should try that out too. Um, let's try the Quad Lander first. I don't remember if we've seen that, but uh, yeah, let's try that out first, and if it fails, then we'll have the Lunapod G. If that fails, we still have some time before we have to actually bring the Kerbal back, so we can build something else. Perhaps going with the Nerva and all, I mean, it takes such a long build time to get the Nerva ready. Maybe I should just go with a normal J2 stage, at least it'll separate properly. Okay, so let's see with this quad lander. Oh, it's got a Gemini cabin and a Mark 1 lander can. Hmm. Well, I hope it's got a remote control unit. It's been quite a long time since I built this. Uh, some people don't understand how long the gap is, but if I take a look at when I actually designed this quad lander, uh, it was March 23rd, so it's been almost five months. So uh, please forgive me if I don't remember everything. Uh, and it would be difficult for me to keep notes on every single vehicle that I have made, because I've made quite a lot. Okay, so there's a Fiji 2R1 launch. We've done those before. Much smaller than the Fiji 551. Here we go. Lots of thrust weight ratio right off the start. All right, boosters are off and boosters have separated. All right. Uh, that was the fairing. Okay, engine cluster. Hmm. Okay, and how about the J2? There we go, finally what we wanted to see. I probably should have separated the fairings manually then. That's what went wrong. Okay, so this is weird. This is the quad lander, obviously meant to host four Kerbals. But does it have a remote controller on it? That I do not see, actually. So it might be that there needs to be a Kerbal in it for it to work out. Which is probably a bad idea on my part. We'll find out. Either that or I tucked one in somewhere. Would have been a good idea, huh? Okay, well, interesting thing about this system as we get close to orbit is that we're not going to end up in orbit with enough to actually transfer. And so it's going to need some of the fuel up here in order to transfer and capture around the moon. Well, we'll see how that works. All right, that's off. Well, Mechjeb, just get us uh, maneuver over there. So, yeah, uh, just home and transfer. Well, I guess we'll try and line up with Moonport 1. Though, it looks like we'll need a mid-course adjustment, really, for that. I hope that's enough power. We know that the Gemini pod consumes quite a lot of it. But it seems to be recharging right now. And we've still got the Saturn core. Okay, and checking that fuel is settled. All right, ignition.
All right. Separation. And, well, we appear to have some... Well, something's going on, but... Apparently not enough. Oh, feed pressure too low. I did not see that coming. I didn't make these service module tanks. Well, there are a lot of tanks that are strapped down to this. I didn't see that coming. Wish there was a way to fix that on the fly, but nope. Well, this is a goner. It also really doesn't have enough to make orbit around the moon and land on its own. It would need to refuel, actually. I'm not too fond of this system right now. We'll leave it here as sort of a rescue vessel. I mean, not much of one, but... Anyway, back to... Back to Space Center, yep. You know, it's not too bad an idea for us to just launch a lot of these missions that we've got lingering around here. Uh, these Mars class vessels can wait until the Earth to Mars transfer window, but otherwise it's a lot of moon and Earth orbits, resupply missions, and crew transfer vehicles. This ISRU though, that's different. Uh, maybe we should try out ISRU around the moon, but the question is, uh, did we have a scanner around the moon? I see one of the things I didn't think to jot down. Um, and the thing is, every time you go to a tracking station and jump to ships, uh, it makes it more likely for the game to crash. I think for now I'm just going to... No, I mean, I guess there's no harm in launching it to lunar orbit and then deciding where to land it later. Yeah, okay, let's try this ISRU just to break the, break the scheme of things. And then after that, if I have time, I'll launch the Lunapod G. We do need to launch something to the moon to try and make sure the Kerbal has a way to get back home, but uh, we've got options. We've got options. Most of these Luna pods and stuff like that don't take that long to build. The, the mission that I'd started off with, the Super Lem, that takes a while to build, like 70 days. But still, 70 days means that we have enough time to build two of them before there's any problem with food, water, and oxygen. Okay, so this was just an ISRU test article that we were supposed to send to the moon. And when you think about it, if we can do ISRU on the moon, that sure changes the equations quite a lot. Um, we still can't use Hydrolox because we don't have any engines that can uh, throttle and be restarted frequently uh, that use Hydrolox. But we could give the huge tanks of uh, liquid hydrogen nuclear engine a try per uh, perhaps if we could get liquid hydrogen from the moon. So let's see if this works out. And I need KOS on the bright side. Um, it is a Fiji 21, so we know we can get to orbit at least. What happens after that is a separate question. It's just a test article though, it can't actually replenish anything, and we don't really need it at our base per se. Okay, run. PG-21. And we're off. Alright, one engine out on the first stage, as usual. Alright, separation of first stage, and here we have the second stage. That's fine. Well, I guess I'll have to manually separate the fairings. That's getting pretty obvious. So this is our, our unit. Uh, the drills have been modified by me because uh, otherwise they'd be way heavier than they need to be, but still non-RP0 technically. And this unit, Convertitron 125, also modified by me so that we can convert to liquid hydrogen. And actually that conversion is based on assumptions that are actually meant for Mars, but uh, 
we'll see how they work on the moon. We've got plenty of power with four solar panels at the top here. And we're actually using an Agena engine in order to make orbit, it looks like. And then subsequently, of course, the Gemini lander engines in order to land. Well, right now it's configured to allow conversion to liquid methane and liquid oxygen. That's why we have empty amounts of liquid oxygen and liquid methane here. So it's not actually trying to drill for liquid hydrogen, but we can change that. As long as this conversion works, then any other conversion using the same module will work too. Obviously, methane and oxygen aren't things that you can... I mean, well, the oxygen, yeah, but uh, the methane is not something you can actually get from the moon. But... It'll be alright. Uh, we'll, we'll make sure that we drill for the right things on, at the right location in the future. Testing this would be good too for our next series of Mars launches. By 272 days we need to get ready for our next sortie and maybe a bunch of ISR unit, units and more base units scattered around the place might be a good idea. Some rovers, that sort of thing. We have demonstrated that we can land a Kerbal on Mars, so maybe we should uh, get some more assets around there. Some more light landers wouldn't be a bad idea too. Okay, we are in orbit and everything is good. We have enough fuel to transfer to the moon. Uh, let's get the solar panels out right now before I forget. Okay, and then, not rendezvous planner, maneuver planner, home and transfer. We'll just take that, it doesn't matter exactly where we land after all, and we'll have to fine tune it anyway. Judging from the previous launch, it seems like the automatic transfer leads us in a polar orientation around the moon, which will be fine for this. Of course, this is just a test, and it is not meant to regain orbit around the moon after it's landed. It's just going to land and stick there. Interestingly, the drills seem to drill for a heck of a lot more than... I mean, I don't know exactly... Uh, these, this is a modification by USI, I think. I, I hope they can just drill for ore like they're supposed to. Or is the only thing we can convert to what we need. Okay, ignition. Oh, well, that's equatorial, not polar at all. Okay. Alright, well, we are on our way with this. Uh, focus on the moon, we should be able to see if there's any resources if we've already scanned for them, so hold on, the game is thinking. And yeah, okay, so we do have an indication of resources, and ore is in these locations. Um, really, we should be aiming for water, I suppose, but yeah, there's not that much ore around. But anywhere along this area would be good. We'll figure it out when we get there. Maybe I should just have it be converting water. That makes sense for both the the moon and Earth. Uh, not Earth, uh, Mars. Because you need the water for the hydrogen if you're going to make methane. I'll think about that. Okay. Yep. And uh, let me double check that I do have multiple ignitions. Yes, there's 14 more ignitions on the Agena, so we can go ahead. Let's try and land this on the moon. Finally, we've got a mission properly on its way to the moon. It's about time. Okay, well, 86 kilometers is a fine periapsis around the moon and we're not concerned about our inclination somewhere there will be the resources we need okay I'll shut down there the periapsis is pretty low and 
yeah, let's see where we can land now. Uh, focus on the moon. Give me ore. And this is our orbit. I don't really want to land in the dark, which leaves us about here-ish. Uh, that's pretty cratered. Uh, is there any chance that there's water there as well? Because that will be a good secondary test. Um, nope, that's not water. Where's water? Oh, there's no water water. Well, it's not going to be salt water. Okay, so yeah, I'll try and land around here somewhere. And we should have a decent amount of thrust weight ratio. Let me double check. Yeah, uh, lunar thrust weight ratio is, you know, three or more all the way, so we can uh, make sure that we start retro burning here. And that should get us where we want to go. The sun is above the horizon. Maybe around here, past that crater right there. Let's see. Okay, yep, we should be descending firmly in the purple area, the area with ore, some ore, not a whole lot of ore. The cutoff there is only 40%, so... There could be higher concentrations of ore somewhere. Alright, separation, and ignition. We're basically going to be landing straight down. Not the best thing, but we have enough fuel for it. Landing struts down. Alright, we can probably... Let's see, suicide burn is 3 minutes. So, 1758 we can start. for our final burn here. Uh, it's not the smoothest terrain, but what can we do? Oh, 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 oh. Ooh. Had a bad start on one engine. Let's let that suicide burn countdown tick down. Just a bit. Around here in this little pit, I think will be good. Let me manually take control now. Uh, looking at the slope looks uh, difficult to, to determine, really. Um, doesn't look great. We're using a minimal amount of thrust just to keep the engines going so I have a suicide burn countdown. Okay, we are on the surface. Let's turn RCS off. RCS off. Oh wait, that's a save. Quick saving, quick saving, quick saving. Alright. And let's deploy the drills. Deploy drill. Let's... I don't know if it's a good idea. Wow, that uh, drill actually lifted us up. Maybe we should just have one drill at a time. Start ore harvest. It says wa water harvest is an option, but I just don't know where the water concentrations are because we didn't see that on the map. Uh, we seem to be getting some ore, but it's not very quick. And it's also rocking us about a lot. Maybe I should deploy the other one, but I'm afraid it's actually going to lift us up off of our... Landing, yeah, look at that. Uh, it's a little bit problematic here. Start ore harvester. Well, now we've got two. And I can't say that's really improved our situation. We we're rocking quite a lot. Electric charge seems fine, though. Well, we haven't started the converter. The converter is pretty intense on the electric charge consumption. The drilling is not so bad. When, when I time warp, the drilling continues, and we don't rock around, so that's nice. Let's... Oh wait, 
it stopped doing the ore production suddenly for some reason. Why? Why at point one did it stop? Hmm, start ore harvester. Start ore harvester. I guess it automatically stops at a high warp, but will it continue when I'm not focused on it? Seems the fourth notch is okay. Let's get one unit of ore first and then I'll try running the converter at the same time. But this is sure taking a while to get ore, huh? But then again, well, oh, the time really is flying. I'll have to do some math on whether this is the right rate, but we have to see how much we can convert to methane and oxygen first. Okay, both our drills have stopped. We've got one unit of ore. Let's start the converter. And we're going to convert, let's just say, to uh, LOX, liquid oxygen. Well, the converter works very quickly and doesn't seem to have any electric charge problem with the liquid oxygen. And it's uh, not quite one to one. It's 91% uh, conversion from ore to liquid oxygen. Which actually makes a lot of sense for water. When you think about it, the... Uh, yeah, well anyway. Uh, we'll hold off on any judgment on that. So, it works. We've got liquid oxygen here. So, that's a uh, start. I'll have to take a look at other details about whether it's operating when I'm not focused on it. I don't know about the time warp thing. That time warp thing might be related to KSP Interstellar. I've had problems with KSP Interstellar uh, causing weird drain when time warping past a certain amount. But anyway, for now, uh, I'll take this one victory after multiple defeats. And uh, with this ISRU unit on the moon, I'll say thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did enjoy this video, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.